Hi, everybody. I know this. <laughs> I was looking so forward to being with everyone in person for once. Um, but the flight was canceled. And so here we are. So it's a good thing we are right. A flexible. It's so important. Um, before we get started, though, I would love it if we could take out a piece of paper or pull out your phone and jot down everything that is on your mind. Um, let's give you a second to do that. And since I can't see you, I'm going to assume that you're doing <laughs> that you're doing it. And when you're done, let's take that piece of paper and or that um, app, and we're going to just close it, put everything in a safe space. And for the next hour or so, we're going to just be together um, with minds as calm as they can be. I always tell my kids that this is our classroom. And let's put all of the things that we can't control, the things that are weighing heavy on us right now, on a piece of paper and then in our bag. And because they deserve 42 minutes for themselves. Making the space in our classroom important helps them to quiet their mind. And maybe, just maybe, they will be able to see a way through the things that are weighing heavy. Our kids come into our classroom with lots of things on their mind and it's so important for them to develop ways to kind of clear that out and spend 42 minutes of sacred time with each other learning and growing. Prior to March 13th, uh, March 13th 2020, uh, that exercise we just did would have been an occasional thing I did in the classroom. Um, when I thought the kids really needed it, when they were, when I could see that they were stressed or I there was something happening in the outside world that was affecting them. Um, but today I try and do it three times a week, if not almost every day, uh, because my students like having that minute to get to decompress, to focus, and to breathe. And they feel just like we do. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but I feel um, overwhelmed with all kinds of things to do in my mind all the time lately. It seems like since we went into this hybrid world, the world of simul teaching, that we um, have to be on all day long and, you know, and sometimes um, um, all night long. But 18 months ago, like most teachers, I had a weekend to retool the whole thing that we did in the classroom um, and, and reimagine it in a virtual space. So I spent a lot of time trying to console my students. Many of them were scared, detached, isolated, and confused. Um, many of them... Um, there are, there, um, are, they were talking to me and my screens from them looked a lot like this. <laughs> I don't know if any of you were in the classroom um, over the past year and a half, but if you were, I'm guessing a lot of your rooms looked a lot like this. Many of you might have been doing this yourself. You were in your um, houses and you were working with your own students while you were trying to work yourself. And apparently, 64 million households were watching this, including myself. I know. I couldn't look away. I, I think some of my self-care in, involved uh, some schadenfreude. Yeah. So many of Americans also watched Gut Wrenched as the stories of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd came across our screens, reminding us of Eric Garner and Michael Brown and Tamir Rice and other citizens of color whose stories were at whose stories we were asked to help our students process, even though we were having trouble processing them ourselves. But teachers carried on. We dug deep and we worked and we worked and we worked <laughs> and we worked. I'd like to think that we emerged from the years of pandemic teaching and the, and the drive-by birthday parties and the puppy adoptions and the hunts for toilet paper, that we emerged learning a few things. 
So what I would like you to do is take a moment and talk to the people at your table or who are sitting next to you on their computer and tell them what have you learned from COVID era instruction and education that you want to pursue. There was lots of stuff we don't want to pursue, but there were some real gems. What were they? Either at the classroom or systems level. I'll give you a minute to talk about it. About another 30 seconds or so. Well, I hope that there were lots of things to talk about um, at your table. I know that the one thing that I thought the most about after our last 18 months is that teachers really needed courage to be successful. That courage to take risks, learn something new, make mistakes, listen to and have difficult conversations with kids and all the rest of the public school um, and all of the rest of the stuff that we do that puts us in the crosshairs of um, opponents of public schools. Courage was the number one trait that I, that I had to develop for and because of my students. Students needed teachers to be brave in the face of such uncertain times. But frankly, according to recent research, teachers make about 1,500 um, decisions every day. And I'm pretty sure a bunch of those require um, a level of courage that most fields don't require. I'm gonna show you a quick little clip. I hope it works, fingers crossed, about, uh, about how we get there. How do we get to courage? What happened with you and Lily? I don't know. I guess I didn't listen to something she told me or something. I mean, I liked her. It's like you embarrass yourself if you say something. You embarrass yourself if you don't. You know, sometimes all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage. Just literally 20 seconds of just embarrassing bravery. And I promise you, something great will come of it. I hope you were able to hear that all right. It's hard to know. It's hard to know what's happening from this side. Okay, so now we know what it takes, 20 seconds of insane bravery. Um, but how do we get ourselves to a place where taking a risk and being courageous, especially in education, especially in the atmosphere today, is actually something sane and will not, um, you know, jeopardize your career? Um, I would say that there are several steps, but the first of which is to put your students first. I had a pretty good idea that having courage and being brave were very important characteristics of, a, of um, effective teaching. 
and teachers uh, early on in my career. I had been teaching about five years on 9-11, and we were in the room when we heard over the loudspeaker that the first plane had hit the tower, and the bell had rung, and I had a very small conference in class at that time, and the looks on my kids' faces was incredibly scared and worried. They kept asking where, um, if they could call their parents, if they could see what was happening. So I took them at the time. You couldn't stream anything live. There was nothing on demand. So we had to go to the media center in our library where we had a, a few TVs. And we joined about a dozen other people in there trying to figure out what was happening in our world. And we actually happened to be there when um, the second plane hit the tower. And my students really needed um, time to be with each other and to be with me to try to help them understand what was happening, even though we certainly didn't know what was happening. So this past um, anniversary, uh, the 20th anniversary, I received a Facebook uh, direct message from a student who was in that class. And I'd like to read that to you. She writes, as always, I was thinking of you today. The morning air felt exactly the same as it did that day. I thought of our tight knit, global class and the shock that we would all be overcome with. I thought of the lesson that you probably spent a long time planning for us that you tossed to the side. For me, that sort of that was sort of the best lesson you or any teacher ever taught me. That sometimes what you plan for doesn't work out because something bigger and more important is occurring. Thank you for making that day a big deal for us for knowing that at the time, we might not understand the magnitude of that day, but in years to come, it would click. For taking us out of the classroom and into the office to watch the news live because it was history. There will never be a 9-11 that I don't think of you or our class. Because of you, I watch every single 9-11 documentary or special. I actually have two DVR'd, she writes, that I'm about to watch now that my children are asleep. Because of you, I want to know who these people were, what their stories were, and I want to fight to keep their memories alive. When you're, ninth, when you're in ninth grade, you don't really grasp the reasons why you have to learn about history. After all, it's in the past. And as an adult, though, I cannot appreciate watching the news live that day more. It is forever embedded with me. I didn't cry that day. I was shocked. As an adult, I cry every single 9-11. The day is almost too heavy with emotion for me. I cried passing the high school today because of how beautiful the outside looked, adorned with flags and flowers. That day, there was a woman in the office with us. She was standing behind us and crying. If I close my eyes, I could still see her. It was only weeks later we found out that she had lost her husband on that day. I'll never forget her or what it must have been like for her to watch the news that morning, knowing what most likely happened. As an adult, I have a whole different level of empathy for those we lost that day. As an adult, I have a whole different perspective of the horror that so many faced that morning. As a mother, my heart aches every 9-11, and I pray that history never repeats. I don't remember the lesson you had planned that day. I don't remember the lesson you planned on, sorry, I don't remember what unit we were on or what the lesson was on September 12th. What I will always remember, however, is you canceling everything and all of us huddled around t the TV together. Thank you for, for teaching me history and for showing me why I should appreciate it and care about it. That's the goal of a teacher, right? Most of the work we do, we won't know how it affects kids until we hear from them 10 years later. We certainly can assess what they're learning in class. We can do an exit ticket. We can see where they're at at the moment in time, but we don't fully understand the real impact of what we do and how we do it for kids until years later. The, I was so touched by this letter. This is the kind of stuff that keeps you going when things are hard. Now, the thing is, it wasn't always like this in education, right? And this is your 150th anniversary. And so I thought about um, in um, 1871 when 
when uh, the Buffalo Normal School opened its doors to its first class. The school's sole purpose was to train teachers to meet the demand of, of Buffalo's ever-growing population of public school kids. And at the time, the idea of what qualities teachers possesses to be effective were quite different from what is expected from teachers today. So, for example, the famous Horace Mann once said, was woman's true calling one that would take advantage of all her natural God-given talents as a nurturer? Rather, teaching, Horace Mann once said, was, was woman's true calling, one that would take advantage of all her natural God-given talents as a nurturer. As a teacher of schools, how divinely does she come, her head encircled with a halo of heavenly light, her feet sweetening the earth on which she treads, and the celestial radiance of her benignity, making vice begin its work of repentance through every, through very... I think, through very envy of the beauty of virtue. I can barely get through it because it's so repulsive to me. <laughs> I like the idea, though, of how my feet sweeten the earth. Hmm. Or this other gem that I also loved from a New York um, philanthropist who said, women have a native tact in the management of very young minds, which is rarely possessed by men. They have a peculiar power of awakening the sympathies of children and inspiring them with the desire to excel. <laughs> These are quotes, by the way, that I found in um, a great book called Teacher Wars. I don't know if anyone's read it, but it gives you a lovely history of teaching. And the more I read it, the more I realized not much has actually changed in the 150 years of your school's um, existence. Maybe my peculiar powers, though, of awakening the sympathies of young children were at work on that day 20 years ago. But I'd like to think that at that time, five years into my career, that I realized to meet the needs of my students where they were made me um, an effective teacher, would make me an effective teacher. We have goals and we have let learnings and there are Regents exams, but it is so important that we meet our kids where they are. And if, and if that's on an emotional level, then that's where it has to be. So step two is you have to own your own mistakes to find your courage, right? You don't know it all. I don't know it all. I tell my students all the time, if I had all the answers, I would be in a lovely suite at the water gate with a direct line to the president, and, I, and he'd call me at any time, and I'd be able to impart my wisdom. But since that's not the case, we know to be human means, even for teachers, that we make mistakes. But we should know as much as we can about our students, right? Every single thing we do must be rooted in our kids, the kids in front of us. I had uh, my uh, pal, Art Willis, he was um, a Quaker. I grew up in a very small town, actually out, about 30 miles outside of Albany called Quaker Street, New York. It's a population 250 people. Um, my high school um, had graduating classes of 69 or 70 kids, and everybody you met in kindergarten were the people that you graduated with. So it was a very tight-knit, close community. And Arthur Willis um, was uh, uh, an influential part of my life. He was also a social studies teacher at Voorheesville High School, that's the school I went to. And years later, he would become my a cooperating teacher as I was getting a... Um, my master's degree at then Union College, which is now uh, Clarkson University. And I remember many times after a particularly tough day with the freshman class, Art would say, Jen, some boys who are particularly wiggly, right, would drive me a little crazy. And, and they would make me a little exasperated because I couldn't get them to do the work I had created and spent all night making these worksheets, right? And he said, 
they might make you feel as though you've chose the wrong profession, but I want you to know that the wiggly ones are wiggly because they want you to see them so badly, really see them. They want to be important to you. He always said to have the, to have the courage to build relationships using the content as a vehicle for getting to know them. The kids will respond. Let them know that they matter to you, to the world, and you will be able to teach them anything. The tests will come. And the thing is, he has always been right about that. Your first priority should be getting to know your students. You don't have to give them survey after survey and quote unquote waste time that a lot of my math and science colleagues like to tell me. You can use your content to create situations where the kids are sharing bits of themselves with other people, with you, because if that relationship is lacking, you don't really have them and you don't really know what they're learning. I'd like to give you um, an opportunity to read this wonderful poem. I put a couple of QR codes, which should bring us to the poem itself. And once you've read it, it's a beautiful poem about creating a brave space. Maybe I'll read it out loud because I'm not exactly sure what you can and cannot do from my perspective here. Together we will create brave space because there is no such thing as a safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we all have caused wounds. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. The space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. That's the kind of space that creates relationships and opportunities for learning that last long after that Regents exam or AP test or your class is over. Let's think about what, what, what we can do to make that space. So if you went on the QR code, you can see these questions in front of you. And I'd like if the table, I'm not sure what size tables you're in, but if it's a big table, maybe you wanna split it in half and answer these questions in your group. Because it's great for me to tell you, let's create a brave space so kids can be courageous and you can learn who they are and put them first. But unless we know what that looks like, it's just words, right? So if you can get together with your, with your pals, I'll give you, mm, I'm thinking five minutes. It's a little awkward for me to sit here, but I will. I'm hoping that you're working on it together. What passages stand out to you? What does a brave space look like? What's one thing you're doing already that creates a brave space? What do you hope to do to create a brave space in your future classrooms? Did anyone create a brave space for you? And what did they do that made you feel brave and courageous? Okay. I'll give you a few minutes to get that figured out. Great. If you're in tables of three to five, you could just all do it together. That'd be great. And about in about five minutes, we'll pull you back together.
Yeah, and if there's a bunch of you online who want to have this conversation, I would love to see your stuff in the chat. That would be awesome. So please feel free to participate via the chat, everybody at home and outside the room. What does it look like to make a brave space? Thank you, Teresa. Yeah. Yes. Great, Susanna. Yes. Authenticity. Excellent, Susanna. Kids can tell if you're faking it. They're better at it than adults, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Inclusive to everyone, yes, regardless of who they are. All voices are elevated, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Asma. About another minute or so. Yeah, excellent, Jason. Yep. And I'd be curious to know how, how or if your teacher made you feel safe and, and really just brave, right? What were some techniques? If you think about the teachers that you liked the most, that you identified with the most, why did you? I'll give you another 30 seconds. Uh, the teacher was non-judgmental. Yes, yes, right, right. All voices are valued. And that can be super hard for teachers because maybe you don't agree with what you know, a student is saying, right? It's hard to value all voices, but it's so important. You'll never get them to share again if you shut someone down. Oh, okay, Teresa. Yeah, teacher spent time with outside of class. Yeah, yeah. They need to see you as a human being, right? They need to know that when you make a mistake that you're just like they are, right? And that you're in this together. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Thanks. Thank you for participating, folks at home. I'm going to leave the chat open so I can see it while you're talking to me. And I'd like to move on to step three. Be vulnerable. Folks in our chat here that I was looking at online were saying exactly that, right? Risk is the bedrock of success. Think about all the things in your life that have made you successful. I'm pretty sure most of them were not safe choices, right? I'm pretty sure that when something didn't feel right, you went left, right? You just have to pay attention to your gut. And for students, they need to know that you don't think you're the most important person in the room. I used to be asked, I, I don't know if they still ask this question um, in interviews, but when I was interviewing 25 years ago, by the way, um, the, one of the questions was always, would you rather be respected or, or liked? First of all, I don't really know, I don't really look, look at those as um, mutually exclusive things, but I would say that today you have to be you have to be willing to share yourself with your students and that you have to be willing to be vulnerable, right? I remember the day after um, Columbine, I was being given um, my 10 year observation and I had planned this whole thing with um, Chinese propaganda posters. I wheeled in my cart. I had the I had the paper, I had all the, all the art supplies. We were, we were talking about communism, you know, communist um, uh, revolution and the role of Mao Zedong. And in walks the assistant superintendent and I turned to her and I said, there's no way I'm doing this today. My students look on their faces, they were so stressed out. It was one of the, I believe it was the first time really that we had, focused as a country um, on a school shooting and my kids were not well. And you know that, you know when that happens, you walk in the room and they are preoccupied. Now this is again, before phones were a really big deal. So no one was on their phone, but they were preoccupied in their own minds. They were quiet, they were shuffling in, they weren't their normal boisterous self. They, they things were weighing heavy. And to her credit, she said, do what you would normally do. Now that's a courageous response for, for, from um, an assistant superintendent. And it was, and I was so grateful for her permission to be authentic in my room with my students, meeting them where they were. So remember it is, again, if you're not responding to your kids' needs, you're not doing this job right. And it's a hard one because I was not really taught that way 25 years ago. The things that they taught me, I, do, I don't really apply, you know, entirely today. Certainly, to, you know, to know your content and to know how to teach it to students for sure. Um, but the mental health issues that kids are coming with, the kinds of... Um, the kinds um, of societal pressures and political climate that we're teaching in, these things obviously were not, uh, I was not taught how to navigate those things. And so the what I have discovered is the best way to do that is to be as authentic to yourself and to, for your students as you possibly can be. If you root everything in kids, it's very difficult to dismiss what you're saying. So, I guess I didn't feel, think twice about responding to my kids on that day um, and putting their needs over my lesson plans because I was raised by entrepreneurs and Quakers. Now, I know that may sound a little bit odd, but I think that the entrepreneurial spirit of risk-taking in general and the fact that um, the Quakers are conscientious objectors, I, that kind of made me, you know, a professional conscientious, you know, um, uh, objector. My parents' store was right near um, 
the meeting house. This is my oh, and this is and this um is my grandfather's diner, also in the same town. And these and this is my parents' store. And the and in you know in the space of own your own business, I learned how to volunteer in the community to serve others, to to make. Um, choices that weren't always popular, but were necessary. Um, and all this was taking place right next door to my friend Art Willis and the Quakers at the Quaker Street uh, um, meeting house. And I also stuttered. I still have trouble today um, when I'm nervous or when I'm doing a speech, mostly because um, there isn't a lot of space for me to think up new words to replace the ones I know I'm going to have trouble on. So scripted work was always tough. Um, it was always tough for me. I've been studying pretty badly since the time I was two and a half or three, probably into my fifth or sixth year of teaching. Um, I could not string a sentence together until high school, and only then when I could think of synonyms for the words that I knew, as I said. I knew I was, I, I hated giving speeches. <laughs> I don't love them still to this day, even though I do five shows a day, five days a week, right? But, but I handled it the best I could in front of my students by telling them up front that I do have a stutter and how a stutter works. Back then I used to describe it as um, a radio wire, how to shorten it. And so sometimes you can hear your radio beautifully and sometimes you can't. Today I might call it, you know, um, mm -hmm. buffering, right? I'm constantly buffering and waiting for things to go smoothly. Um, the crazy part is, is that my students were always kinder um, and more accepting after I had explained to them about why and that I did stutter than before when I tried to hide it. Modeling that vulnerability and taking the risk to tell them about why I do what I do resonated with them. And it still does mm -hmm. today. Students respond to teachers that are real, authentic, willing to go on a limb, and mostly because they feel, they feel vulnerable every day. They see me and others moving through fear toward achievement of goal or dreams, and they think and know that it's possible. These are two of my favorite heroes, um, Simone Biles, as you know, and of course, Nelson Mandela. I look to them because they led not only by example, but by putting, but by putting themselves first in terms um, of Simone Biles and putting her own health and, and um, protecting herself, which is so important to teach kids about boundaries and about your own power. And Nelson Mandela, who in the service to others spent 19 years um, in prison and then becomes the president of South Africa. These are stories of people who have experienced things that were tougher than anything I've ever experienced. And yet when you're experiencing something hard, you can draw strength from these folks. And I try to make sure that my classroom is filled with images of all kinds of people surviving all kinds of things so that the kids understand that life is hard and we have these hard discussions in class because I want them to know how to navigate what happens after they leave high school. Step four, walk away from sameness. Here's the thing about me. I, I don't really like doing things the way other people <laughs> do them. Um, I don't know if it's the entrepreneurial bringing or coupled with my dad's uh, his libertarian, rugged individual uh, approach to life or the Quaker idea that there is something of God in everyone and that each human being is unique. Um, but I'd like to do things my way. I Now, I don't. Now, don't get me wrong, um, I know I don't know everything, and I ask everyone's insight and gather information and then do it my way anyway. My husband loves this about me. 
<laughs> he asked me frequently, why do you ask me if you're just going to do things the way you want to do them? Um, and why? Because I like to learn what I don't know, listen to other people who have had different experiences and thoughts um, th than I've had, and then synthesize from those inputs what I think would work best. It is apparently infuriating to my husband, but it has worked for me. Administrators don't love it either, <laughs> but I try and model the beauty of going one's own way or pushing the envelope, not only personally, but professionally for my students. It's so important that they learn how to move outside their comfort zone because that is where the magic happens. I notice that the more uncomfortable they are, the greater an opportunity I have to get them a little bit further into their own growth. Nobody grows from having everything perfect. I think about Switzerland, who hasn't really been involved in any wars, and they haven't had really too many natural disasters, and nothing really bad ever happens from there. And what have they created? The cuckoo clock, right? And fondue. So I think that it's important that we help our kids struggle to build strength, and to learn to rely on themselves, right? That they have their own agency and their own power. Um, I did this about seven years ago. Um, we, we, um, we got a new superintendent and about a couple of weeks before her official start date, I had attended a conference and at, and at the conference, there was a presentation um, teaching us about how to use the teaching channel. This is when it was first, it had first come out. And they had a little platform on the teaching channel that allowed schools to create a private space where teachers could upload videos and share their work with their colleagues. And what I loved about it was that it gave the teachers in my district who had recently become board certified teachers. So we have about 20 at that time. And I said to myself, we've got, we, we have all these board certified teachers. They're all dressed up with no place to go. We had no formal roles for them. There was no formal funding. They achieved our profession's um, highest uh, certification and didn't have anything to do with it other than go back to the classroom, of course, and, you know, and be their effective selves. So I, so I thought, wouldn't it be awesome if our, if our new NBCTs, our board certified teachers could mentor the teachers in our district who did not qualify for New York State mentoring. So in New York State mentoring, if you've never taught any place else before and you go into a, um, a school, a, a district is required to give you a one-on-one -on -one mentor. If you have taught somewhere else or you've received tenure somewhere else, then they are not required to give you a mentor. And most schools, in fact, do not. But there's still a culture that, that has to be learned in the school. There are still questions that they have. And, if, and, and I don't know about you, but I feel like I didn't get into the groove of this teaching thing until I was probably 10 years in. So everybody needs support. And so what we did was we matched these 20 MBCTs with the teachers who did not receive um, formal mentoring. And we created a program where they would upload their videos on the teaching channel and the, um, and the um, MBCTs would then give them formal uh, observations. There's a time-stamped feature and so they were able to show them exactly where in the lesson they felt that they were not being as effective or they weren't addressing a need or someplace where they did an amazing job and it was super helpful and it went, it went so well that now it's become a four-year program called TAPS and it's for all teachers who enter Oceanside School District they get four years of mentoring until they attain tenure but I digress. So what I did was I went to the conference. I got this great idea. We had the, we, we had the human capital. We had the physical capital. I had a brand new superintendent who didn't know much, right, about Oceanside. So I 
um, struck while the iron was hot. It was a perfect storm of all the good things that create an opportunity for something different. Lucky for me, my uh, superintendent, her name um, is Dr. Phyllis Harrington. She was she was 100% behind any kind of professional uh, a professional development for teachers. And when I showed up there, I brought a folder filled with all of our MBCT's names and all of the programs that they had started or run in the district. So she could see how powerful these folks were. And, and then I said, oh, and by the way, there's a little grant for this, but they won't give us the grant or consider us, you know, for the grant unless you match the funds. It's only $5,000. <laughs> so, yeah. So her first interaction with me was, hey, got this great idea and I need some money. But the thing is, I didn't feel like it wasn't my place. Now, I know that makes a lot of people nervous. But what I was doing was, was trying to create something to help our teachers be effective year one, day one. And that only makes them better for kids. My desire to create this program and to, and to help the district came from my desire to help these teachers be the best teachers they could be. It can never be about you that sounds really funny, but it can never be about you and your power. It's always got to be about the kids. So I happen to also love this quote by our friend, uh, Toni Morrison, right? What's the world for if you can't make it up the way you want it? And the thing is, I'm not advocating willy-nilly. I certainly don't want anyone to risk their jobs or, or their livelihood. But if you don't go at this thing we call education that is ever-changing and is super challenging and there are things outside of our, our purview we cannot control, if you don't try to make it better for kids or different for kids that help them respond and do better, then you're not doing your job. My grandmother, uh, Merklin, always told me, she said, uh, when I was talking to her about being afraid to say something or to do something, she'd say, what are you so afraid of? It's only breath and words. Proceed until apprehended. <laughs> so that's pretty much how I've run my entire um, you know, career. It's always easier, as the old adage goes, to say, I'm sorry, right, than to ask for permission. So the, the key for me was I was able to have to make relationships not only with my students, but with my colleagues and administrators. And as a result of that work, I, I had some leverage to create programs in my district. Your job as a new person, as a brand new teacher, or as an aspiring teacher, is to remember that relationships with the secretaries, the custodians, your colleagues, the administration are the pathways to, to doing and getting what's best for your students in your room. Not only your um, education, not only the content that you have mastered, not only, you know, the pedagogy and the interactive, you know, uh, lessons. That's the thing. I mean, everybody's like, oh, but what about the Regents exams? You know, this is all nice. You know, I hear that a lot. This is great. But what about the Regents exams? Um, in 2013, Google decided to test its hiring um, hypothesis where they had, you know, developed a specific algorithm to suss out those people who applied to Google who had all the skills that they wanted. And then they wanted to see, once people were hired, if they were actually any good at what they did. Um, so the project was called Project Oxygen, and the results shocked everyone they found out that among the eight most important mm -hmm. characteristics of Google's top employees, STEM expertise was dead last. Let's take a look. So the first one, right, is being a good coach, communicating and listening well. Possessing insights into others, including values, all right, 
and points of view. Imagine that. Having empathy toward and being supportive of, of one's colleagues, being a good critical thinker, problem solving, being able to make connections. And last on the list was STEM expertise. Huh. In the words of the immortal um, Liza Minnelli, this teaches me, this research, that reality is something you rise above. So it is so important to make sure our kids can do the the academic skills that will prepare them for the future. There is, I, I am not debating that. And, but I also know that it's the content that gets us in the room with kids, but it's how we work that content into their lives and into our lives and into our relationships that makes the difference. You're never going to create a, ses, you know, a successful kid by handing them packet after packet or having them do PowerPoint after PowerPoint or any of those things. That doesn't work. And if it does work, it doesn't last. And I don't know about you, but I'm in the business of helping kids become successful U.S. citizens and citizens of the world. That's the business that we're in, right? So I could say that these last two years were uh, are unique for public education. I could say that this year is going to hold exceptional challenges. But I have to tell you, with all the research I've been doing about this speech and thinking about it in my own practice, that although our teaching context has changed from, pers from in person to online or into virtual platforms or that simul teaching that I did all last year, that was fun. Um, the struggles have largely been the same since Buffalo State was a normal school. Large class sizes, strained resources, teacher autonomy, political charge debates, and indoctrination accusations, the communist accusations of most teachers in the 1950s, um, are the same today. So it's tough out there. This job is not for the faint of heart. You need to be a professional with a warrior's heart that loves other people's children. In my opinion, the work of a teacher is to empower and encourage all, st all students and to sustain our cultural heritage, all of it, not just the good parts. We have to embrace it all and we have to learn from all of it. So let's review. Take a second now and process with your group what makes you uncomfortable or nervous about taking risks? What can you do to mitigate those risks? What did I say today that might make you nervous or that you disagree with? Why do you disagree with it? And what can I do to help move you towards viewing your classroom as a place for students to be themselves? in a brave, brave space. I'll give you two minutes to talk about that. Let's process what I've been talking about. People at home or in the chat, please feel free. I like it when you talk in there. I'd love to see if you have any questions or comments or concerns. Is there anybody still there? <laughs> it's hard to tell from this. <laughs> what makes you uncomfortable or nervous about taking risks? What can you do to mitigate that? Yes, unknown outcomes. Good, Jane. Yep. Yes, unknown outcomes. Guess what? Every time you walk into a classroom, I, except for the lesson plan and what you planned on doing, a lot of what happens in there is an unknown outcome. Is 
the thing about it, Jane, too, I notice is that teachers are pretty smart and you will be able to handle whatever happens in there. And kids say all kinds of things. <laughs> and the key is to remember, we don't want to shut anyone down who is not um, hurting someone else or saying things that hurt themselves or putting other people at risk. Yeah, that's right, Teresa. E right, exactly. Um, a Teresa wrote, keeping focused by not paying too much attention to the noise. Yeah, that's the thing. It's you and your kids in that room. That's the beauty of 42 minutes. And you close that door and you and they control that space. You and they, right? I know. You know who doesn't feel um, comfortable thinking outside the box um, asthma are AP kids. I teach a lot of AP classes. I teach a mix, but I've got three sections um, of AP kids, and they hate it in the beginning. But I tell them that being smart doesn't mean that you can memorize things or get all the right answers. Being smart means you know when to listen, when to work it out, when to push yourself. It takes them a few weeks to get used to that. Some never do, and that's all right, too, right? I mean, all kinds of people with all kinds of skills are successful. I just think a life well lived is one lived in courage, and that's what I try to tell them. Yeah. And the thing is, many... Kids in the advanced classes tend to go on to great universities and become leaders themselves. And these are all also excellent skills to learn as a leader that you don't know it all and that you have to take risks in order to get ahead. So I also try to talk to them about that. Yeah, that's really beautiful, Susanna, yeah. I think my students remember the risks I took. And also owning your mistakes is so important. If I say something that hurts a kid's feelings or if I do something that isn't right, I always publicly acknowledge it and apologize and make up for it because we do make mistakes. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Liza was talking about, like you said, taking risks sometimes is not embraced by school leaders or other teachers. What advice would I give to a new teacher who might face resistance to bold student-centered ideas? I'll tell you my favorite surefire way of learning more about those people who do not agree with you. They say something, you don't like it, or it doesn't sound right, or you don't, you don't agree, and the words you say to them is, tell me more about that. The word no should never be the end of a conversation. It should always be the beginning of making you curious. And when you approach people who do not agree with you with curiosity, wanting to get to know why there's an issue, you are perceived A, not as threatening, and B, open to hearing other people's ideas. A lot of times I hear that new teacher doesn't know their place. That new teacher talks all the time. And so when you are trying to change anything, whether you're a first year teacher or a 25th year teacher, um, the key is to approach everything with an inclusive mindset and just be curious and never take no for a final answer if in your heart of hearts you're, you know your kids need it and you have the data and the evidence to support what you're saying. They need us, our kids. Somebody has to advocate for them. And guess what? You know, it's us. Okay. So I see we're wrapping up the conversation. I'm just going to say one last thing. And that is, how can we as a profession 
create a system that puts relationships with students and families first and create brave spaces for kids and parents and teachers. We create a system founded on our recent learning. Kids need social, emotional learning and support, trauma-informed instruction, and culturally responsive curriculum, period. They need it. Why should this be the foundation of great schooling and not just another add-on to a teacher's already heavy plate? Because it is no longer 1871 or 1950 or 2019, frankly, and we know better, so we have to do better. Rather than forcing teachers to take on SEL curriculum, culturally responsive and trauma-informed teaching, and in addition to making sure they know the content to pass the test, how about we create a system founded on those ideas, founded on those ideas of SEL, trauma-informed teaching, and culturally responsive teaching, and use the content as a way for teachers to create multidisciplinary, hands-on learning experiences, age and grade level appropriate, it takes courage to do what is right, to demand what is right for our students and families. But I'm thinking if not you, then who? Our students can't wait for us to be brave enough to do what's right. Thank you.